Um, so, how many of you have ever played hide and go seek? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you know the classic game, of course, you go and you hide and, and people try and, and there's a, a seeker that's trying to find everybody before you get back. Um, but there are all kinds of variations on hide and go seek. Um, uh, when I was growing up uh, in youth, we had one called sardines. And sardines is kind of like reverse hide and go seek where you've got one person that uh, everybody tries to find and then goes and hides with them. Uh, and, then the, and then the more people that find that person uh, without making a noise to the seeker. Anyway, you get the idea. So in college, we did a different version of hide-and-go-seek altogether. I was with a, a Christian fellowship, and uh, I was, they put me in charge, if you can imagine that. And, uh, and being in charge uh, meant uh, that we were the ones that everyone was trying to find. Uh, we all got to hide in what was in West Town Mall in Knoxville, Tennessee. And um, that is a mall with your s- typical Sears and your Dillard's and your J.C. Penney's and Macy's, all the department stores, and then your quirky other s- types of stores. And we had free reign of the entire mall, uh, and we were to hide there. And then it was the job of the, um, of the rest of the people in our Christian fellowship to try and find us. Well, at the time, it may not be apparent to you now, but at the time I had really long hair, like down to my shoulders. Uh, and I, I am a natural redhead, so I, it was very red. And so um, it's kind of like, you know, Ronald McDonald trying to hide. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if Ronald McDonald looked a little bit like Jesus, because I had a beard going on too and all that. And uh, so I decided to cut my hair just a little bit, not too much, Francis, just a little bit. And I cut it just a little bit, and, uh, and I, I dyed it black, uh, and I had uh, a black beard. And, and rather than trying to actually hide behind some set of clothing or something else, I was just in plain sight. Um, And you would be surprised how many people walked by me thinking that it was me, but they couldn't pinpoint that it was me. It was like there was this case of mistaken identity. They thought, that looks like Don, but we can't quite be sure that it's him. And of course, eventually the gig was up. They got me to speak, and they knew it was me. But, but. But it was a case of mistaken identity because for the longest time, they thought that I was someone else. Maybe you've had that happen in your own lives. Maybe you've had cases of mistaken identity where maybe you have been, have any of you ever been stopped by someone on the street because they were certain that you looked just like a famous celebrity? A few of you had. A few of the rest of you are like, no, I wish that would happen to me. But, um, well, it's, it's, it's a, what's that? Who? Well, we had somebody say something? No? Okay. All right. It's okay. You can call back to me. I'm okay. Um, a case of mistaken identity uh, is, is rather a common occurrence that happens. Uh, and it's something that happens even on Easter Sunday, maybe. And I want to read to you from the Gospel of John. And in John's Gospel in chapter um, 20, we uh, hear... Perhaps a case of mistaken identity remains to be seen. We're about to find out. John chapter 20 with verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in and saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? supposing him to be the gardener. She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Sweet Holy Spirit, I pray that you would be present right now in this place and all that are gathered here and in these thoughts that we have as we come to this day of celebration of Easter Sunday. May you be present as we raise you up. May my words not be my own, but may they be yours. May my mind not be my own, but may it be yours. Most of all, sweet Holy Spirit, may my heart not be my own, but may it be wholly thine, broken and open and honest before these people of God. Amen. So it kind of starts off a little bit like a game of hide-and-go-seek, right? It's dark outside. Um, If you look at the different Gospels, starting off with Mark, um, it's already dawn. And then by the time you get to Matthew's account, which was written a few years later, you see that it's dawning. And then if you look at Luke's account, it was right uh, at the start of dawn. And by the time you get to John's account, written around 85, 90 A.D., you see that it is early on the first day of the week while it was still dark. I think if there had been a fifth gospel written, it probably would have started at about midnight because they kept going backwards just little by little. But the point is, is that it's dark or dirk. And you can't really see very far. You can't really see much of anything there in that early, early, early part of the day. And maybe they are rubbing their eyes just to try and get them open, just to try and to do what needs to be done. Because it says, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. And she's just going to look at it, right? She's going to to mourn. And in some versions and some accounts, we see that she has come with the spices prepared, but, but not here. But she ran and she went to Simon Peter because she had seen that the stone had been removed. She could hardly believe her eyes. It was early in the morning. She thought that's what she saw. She wanted to get confirmation. She wanted to tell someone. She was worried that maybe, maybe someone had removed the stone that should not have removed the stone. In Matthew's gospel, it was the religious authorities that were worried about Jesus' followers. But here in John's gospel, we see kind of the reverse is true. It is his followers that are worried about others that would come in and corrupt the tomb and the body. And she says for the first time, she says, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. And even though it just says Mary Magdalene, when she says we, she is referring to both herself and the other women that would have come alongside. 
Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. And of course, like a standard game of hide-and-go-seek, both the boys are running. And we see that one boy is faster than the other. The, the one whom, the disciple whom Jesus loved, gets there. And Peter's standing there going, ah. The other disciple gets there first. He goes, he looks in, he sees, and he believes. But Peter goes in and he, he, he comes into the tomb and he sees the linen wrappings lying there and they're rolled up and they're just not sure what to make of this because this was not what they thought would happen. But it says they return to their homes. They're kind of done for the day. But Mary just can't let it go. Mary just can't give up. Mary just can't give in. Mary can't just, just let it be. Mary is not going to go home. This is not right, and it does not sit well with her. Mary, it says, stood weeping outside the tomb, much like Jesus had wept when Lazarus was raised, and they had likewise been gathered. Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw now where there had been nothing, there were two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. Well, that's not who we were expecting to see in there. That's something entirely different. And angels often render people afraid in Scripture. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She's so overcome with everything. It's not even fear. She's willing to engage in this conversation. She said, they've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. A second time. It's building. The tension is building. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. Here's the kicker. But she did not know that it was Jesus. How can you follow someone? How can you follow someone for three years? Know them inside and out. And all of a sudden, after a few days, forget them entirely. How can that be? How can they be hidden in plain sight? And yet, it appears that way. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She even hears the sound of his voice in that moment and does not recognize that it's him at first. Supposing him to be the gardener. It's like a case of mistaken identity. Mistaking him for the gardener. She said to him, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him and I will take him away. Third time. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she instantly turns and says to him in Hebrew, Rabboni. She recognizes him as her teacher. And then, she, and then he tells her to go and tell everyone, to go to, to the disciples in Galilee and beyond and all of this. And she's given that commission to give the good news. She is the first preacher, by the way. The first preacher was a woman, let's be clear. And she is that preacher in this moment. But she has this case of mistaken identity. Except, what if? What if it isn't a mistaken identity at all? What if, because of the way that the Bible reads... We understand that it starts in a garden. And, and, and what if we understand that there in Revelation chapter 22, we see that there is yet another garden? And so maybe she's not mistaking him for the gardener, but maybe he has been the gardener all along. 
Maybe he has been the one who has been planting those seeds of hope and new life and resurrection all along. And maybe like his seed, he had to go into the ground so that then three days later he could spring up. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus was the gardener and as the gardener was our Savior. And all along, we were mistaken. Maybe he's not only a teacher. Maybe he's not only a healer. But maybe he is the resurrector of seeds and of souls. And maybe, just maybe, he is ready to turn around again in our lives and remind us what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. What if... Every single one of us, when we went out from this place today, chose to see the world as full of seeds that can be sown, as full of places that need to be watered with hope and with new life. What if we saw and cast a little bit of sunshine and a little bit of Jesus wherever we went? What if we understood our role not so much as simply the bearer of good news, but the bearer of good things. All good things, right? Olaf reminds us. And what if we understood that when we carry the message of Jesus Christ, we not only carry him in our hearts, but we resurrect him each and every moment in each and every relationship, everywhere that we go. What if it was not a case of mistaken identity after all? But what if Jesus bloomed right where he needed to be planted? And what if he's calling us to do the same? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us uh, close in a benediction. Gracious, merciful, and redeeming Savior of all the world. We are grateful for this Resurrection Sunday, this Easter where we have not mistaken you for the gardener, but we know that you are fast at work sowing seeds and saving lives. Go forth in his precious name.